Hello everyone. Well, the wait is finally over. I finally get to tear into these systems I bought from VCF. We've got a Gateway 2000 tower there, an IBM Aptiva here, and the Mitsubishi Lap Crusher here. I actually had this exact model laptop when I was a kid, and just seeing it again brought back a flood of fond memories. Well, let's go ahead and tear into these things. Of course, I have to start with the Mitsubishi MP286L. It's really hard to call this thing a laptop. Weighing in at about 15 pounds or 6.8 kilograms, you would definitely have your lap full. Although I did try my best to make that work back in the day. This machine is more akin to a luggable rather than a laptop. The front of the machine has this retractable carrying handle, and it's made out of some pretty thick metal, because you're going to need it. The release latch for the display has lost its springiness. I guess that's a common fault on these machines, because the one I had back in the day had the exact same issue. We'll have to see if that spring is still rattling around in there. Here's the brightness and contrast controls for the display. This is a monochrome display, and this switch here allows you to invert the screen, which, depending on what application you're running, can make things easier to see. Hopefully we can get this machine functional enough to where I can show that to you. And we've got our WordPerfect hotkey legend here. Quite a few of the portable computers at VCF West had this tape to them, so they may have all come from the same organization. Got a copyright date of 1989 on that. And here's the left side of the machine. Got our power switch here. Got our internal floppy drive. And I'm not quite sure what's behind this plug here. I guess we'll find out. And here's the back side of the machine. So you've got our standard IEC power connector here. And that is our only power option for this machine. There are no DC power inputs and no battery whatsoever. And down here we have a connector for the external floppy drive. Got our cooling fan here. Got two serial ports here. A parallel port. Got our dial-up modem. And here's our connector for the external monitor. And I can't remember if this is CGA or EGA, but it could also be monochrome. And here's the right side of the machine. You can see luckily we do have a hard drive. Looks like an MFM drive with stepper motor driven heads. So that should make some fun sounds. And here's the label on the bottom of the machine. We have a manufacture date of November 1989. And we see the hard drive type is a number 11, assuming it's the original drive. And here's a look at the original carrying case. It's actually in really good condition apart from being a little dirty. You can see the shoulder strap has these spikes all over it for extra grip and extra pain. And this thing sure was fun to lug around the airports, especially with eight hard drives in this front pocket here. My shoulder still has not forgiven me. The front pocket had a couple of items in it, like this expertly wound power cable and the most robust automotive power inverter I've ever seen completely encased in metal. And that inverter has some provenance on it. You can see it came from the Cal Poly Foundation, or California Polytechnic, so that may have been where this machine was originally being used. And here's the label on that inverter, with a maximum power output of 100 watts. Now, as tempted as I've been to just fire this thing up and see if it works, one must restrain themselves with these things, because we definitely need to test that power supply first. And that, of course, means taking this thing apart. And it's been a very long time since I've taken one of these apart, so I'm gonna have to figure that out all over again. Fortunately, this thing's built like an absolute tank, so I'm not really worried about the plastic breaking. So let's go ahead and get into this thing. Okay, I've got all the screws removed from the bottom. We had five fine thread machine screws on the back here, and three coarse threaded screws on the front. Let's see if that's enough to get into this thing. Okay, looks like the top section should just pull right off, so let's see. Nope, we're hanging up here. Looks like we got one screw at the back, holding up progress. Let's see now. Yeah, there we go. Well, we're most of the way there, but it feels like the monitor cable is very short. Okay, looks like we just have a very short ground strap here holding up the works. So let's get that unscrewed. There we go. Now let's just disconnect that monitor. And we should be free. Yep. And look at that. There's our latch spring. And here's a top-down view of the machine. I see we do indeed have a Type 11 hard drive. Looks like an NEC drive, model D3142. Well, let's see what it takes to liberate that power supply. It's interesting that the power supply is dated 1991, so that may have been replaced at some point. Let's try to get it out of there. It's cool that we have the adjustment pots accessible through these two holes here. That's convenient. Okay, so we had two screws at the front here, and five screws at the back. Here, 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 and here. And I see we have some corrosion here. See, this is exactly why I do this exploratory surgery before just sending power into these things. Well, the power supply is looking loose now, so let's go ahead and pull it out of there. Yeah, there we go. Let's get that disconnected. Okay, fortunately, it doesn't look like that corrosion made it to the board, so we might just be in luck. Well, I don't get to see dip chips in surface mount configuration very often, so that's cool. And this dial-up modem and video card are actually modular, so let's go ahead and pull those out of there. See, they have these little connectors back here. I wonder if that's just ISA in another form factor. But here's our dial-up modem. 
branded Mitsubishi. Let's put that to the side. Now let's get that video card out of there. This is also branded Mitsubishi, copyright 1987. Well, I sure am liking how clean everything is. And beneath both of those, we have our memory expansion card. Looks like it just sits in there. Yeah, there we go. The year marked is 1988. Very good. Aw, oh, poor spider. Well, at least we know the machine is already debugged. All right, let's get this keyboard out of here. Looks like it's just sitting in there. Yes, indeed. They certainly made sure this thing was grounded. And even this plastic shield is held in with screws. And now we can see our hard drive controller, as well as a battery that thankfully hasn't exploded. And it looks like that hard drive cable is being held captive by this battery retaining bracket, so let's get that out of there. And we see the most sinister name in all of retro computing, Varta. Let's get that thing far, far away from here. Now let's get that hard drive disconnected. Might as well disconnect the floppy drive too. Speaking of the floppy drive, let's get that out of there. Wow, that drive has a very weird cable. Looks like it's actually crimped to the board. So I'm gonna have to get the cable out from under that bracket. Okay, on second thought, it looks like it's actually just easier to remove the entire drive cage. Looks like removing six screws accomplishes that. Got two down here, two on the side, and two up here. Okay, let's see. Yeah, that's a lot easier. Let's just get that Molex connector unplugged. Wow, look at that motherboard. Now I can see what's hiding behind that plastic plug. Looks like a bus mouse connector, though it is awfully hard to see. And since we're in this deep, we might as well go full tear down and get rid of this riser. Pretty clean on this side. Wow, Mitsubishi sure was adamant about checking their plastic. Okay, let's go ahead and get rid of this hard drive controller. Looking good. I see we have a slight bit of discoloration on the connector that the riser attaches to. Those are probably the pins that send power to that Molex connector. Hopefully that doesn't cause us any problems. And finally, let's get that motherboard out of there. Let's disconnect whatever this is. Possibly a speaker, though I was sure the speaker was in the monitor. Ah, we had a loose screw down here. See, it's a good thing I do get carried away with these teardowns. And this screw is loose as well. And the underside of the board is incredibly clean. So we have almost all Mitsubishi chips on this thing. They sure had that vertical integration. Aha, that display latch is broken. I'm gonna have to figure out how to put that back together. Now let's take a closer look at that hard drive. You can see it is indeed an NEC drive. I actually have the exact same model hard drive in my NEC PowerMate. They seem to be pretty reliable drives, but with this thing being in a portable system, it could go either way. It's an MFM hard drive, of course, with a super clean logic board. Now let's go ahead and get into this floppy drive. The floppy drive is made by Mitsubishi, no surprise there. The spindle feels good, not sticky at all. Let's go ahead and get this thing open. Looks like we just have two screws at the back here. Yeah, I should be able to pop that lid. And we're minimally dirty inside, not too bad. Let's go ahead and clean those heads. And they were pretty clean already. Let's just clean up the rest of the drive, at least what I can see. Now let's just make sure the mechanism's not all sticky. It's working pretty well. Now let's get some new grease on that tracking screw. And even though the eject mechanism is working fine, I do want to try to refresh that grease. Hopefully I can reach it without doing a full teardown. Okay, that should be good enough. Yeah, that's a lot smoother. Okay, let's see what's going on inside this power supply. It does have that unmistakable burning electronics smell, so I have a bad feeling that somebody tried to power this thing up with not so great results. But let's go ahead and open it up and see what's going on. Okay, I went ahead and got this thing apart and it's not looking good. You see that corrosion definitely got the board. And this is the area where all that terrible burning smell is coming from. That is not a good sign. And this is the part that breaks out to this vertical board here. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and desolder that. And then I'll see if I can just clean up all that corrosion and repair any traces that might need repair. Luckily the fuse didn't blow, so maybe there's a chance I can save this thing. 
Okay, with that vertical board desolder, we can get a better look at the damage here. As far as traces go, I think we're okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and knock that damaged solder mask off with a rubber polishing tool on a Dremel. All right, good thing I did that because now we can see this trace is almost completely eaten through. So we're gonna have to reinforce that. And all these other traces that were corroded, we're gonna have to tin over them with solder. Because anytime this corrosion happens, it thins out the copper and reduces its current carrying capacity. And putting a layer of solder on top helps restore that. But before I do that, there's one other issue I have to address. This Rubicon cap here is actually bulging at both ends. That's pretty unusual for a Rubicon cap. So that tells me this thing probably got a voltage spike. Well, let's just hope the rest of the system survived that. So let's go ahead and replace this cap. Yeah, that cap was getting ready to launch into a low earth orbit. Good thing I caught that. Okay, now let's go ahead and tin up these traces. All right, that'll do it. I promise it looks better in person than it does on camera. I went ahead and reinforced that eroded trace with a copper wire. So let's get this thing back together and see what it does. All right, power supply that I have no pin out for and very little chance of finding a replacement. Let's see what you got. Here comes power. And that's not a good sound. I don't know if the microphone picked it up, but it's making a very high-pitched squeal. And that means something somewhere is shorted. But it did turn on. Maybe there's hope for this thing yet. All right, let's figure out what this thing's squealing about. Okay, I did some off-camera testing, and I found that this capacitor here is getting unreasonably hot. The positive lead for it connects through this diode here to the transformer. So let's see if that diode is shorted. Mm, that sure looks shorted to me. Let's compare it to the diode above it. And that one looks normal. So let's go ahead and pull that diode off of there and check it out a circuit, because it's possible that something downstream is also shorted. All right, let's see. Aha, seem to have wrongly accused this diode. Let's check it in the other direction. Okay, yeah, nothing wrong with that diode. So the short must be downstream. Let's get that thing back in there. Okay, the next stop is this transistor here, buried way down in there. So let's pull that thing out. Aha, that thing's wounded. That's gotta be the source of the short. It also must be the source of that burning smell I noticed earlier. Well, let's see if that short is gone. And yes, indeed it is. Okay, now I just have to locate a replacement for that component. That might be easier said than done. Well, my circuit board hoard isn't exactly what it used to be. And as such, I cannot find a single appropriate voltage regulator. And this only serves to further my hoarding compulsion. And likely the reason why it's hard to find is because it's a 24 volt regulator in a modern world that's clearly dominated by 12 and five volts. And this particular IC is actually no longer in production, but I've ordered a modern substitute from Mauser. I chose two day shipping, but I don't think it's gonna be here in time to make this video. So this might be all that we can do for this system for now. And I've had no luck in finding a pinout for this thing, so I can't even cobble together a temporary power supply, but we can at least see if that hard drive spins up. I can't really do much testing beyond that because with MFM hard drives, if you move them to a different controller, they have to be low level formatted before they can be used with that controller. And I don't want to ruin the data just yet. And this drive should be new enough to not require the park command. So let's go ahead and power that thing up. All right, those are perfectly normal sounds for that drive. Sounds like it might be a good one. Well, let's have a look at that CPU, shall we? And it's an AMD 286. Very nice. I haven't seen very many 286s with a heatsink. I guess there's just special heat considerations in a portable computer. Oh, and I figured out this side port here is actually for a 10 key, otherwise known as a numpad. So that mystery is solved. Well, it certainly hurts to put this one on pause, but I've waited all these years. A few more days won't kill me. Hopefully there aren't many other faults in that power supply, and hopefully it failed gracefully and didn't take out the motherboard. This is why it's so important to inspect these things before you try to power them up. Well, hopefully that UPS package comes quickly. Let's move on to the next system. Next system is this IBM Aptiva Model 2144-M51. This system would have originally had a cover panel across the front here. That is unfortunately missing and is most likely unobtainium by now. But at least we have everything else. We've got a quad speed CD-ROM drive there. And here's a look at the back of the machine. You can see we have onboard everything, except sound. But luckily we do have a sound card up here with a built-in dial-up modem. That's a convenient way to save an expansion slot. See, we do have onboard video, a parallel port, two serial ports, and our PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. And similar to my PS1, all you have to do to open these things is to lift up on this tab here while simultaneously pulling the case forward. So let's open this thing up. And we have quite a few IBM original parts in this thing, including an IBM branded CD-ROM drive. That's interesting. Manufactured August 1995, the floppy drive's also an IBM original, 
And way down in there, we see it does have a hard drive. From what I can see, it looks like a quantum fireball. And the sound card is an IBM original M-Wave card. These cards are not known for being particularly great, but at least it's in there. Let's go ahead and pull it out. Gotta say, with the exception of some surface rust on the inside, this thing is remarkably clean. Hopefully that's a sign of good things to come. The onboard video is a Trident TGUI 9680. Got the feature connector up there. And we are fully populated with 72 pin SIM RAM. And these sockets have the nice metal clips that are less prone to breaking. Let's see what we have in there. No indication of size on that one. At least it's clean. Let's check out the next one. And that's an identical stick. Also pretty clean. Let's see what we have in the upper banks. And that's an eight megabyte stick. Definitely added after the fact. Let's check out the last one. And that stick is identical to the previous one. I'm gonna guess that the first two sticks are eight megabytes each, but we'll have to see what it counts up to. All right, let's get this floppy drive out of here. And it looks like we just have these two screws holding it in. So let's see how far that gets us. Okay, now, do we just slide? Yes, we do. Hey, that was easy. Now let's go ahead and get this riser out of here. Now we got a power connector back here. And that is one clean riser. See, we have some PCI slots interspersed with the ISA slots, so that's cool. Yeah, super clean. We might have to hit that edge connector with some deoxit. And I still can't quite get at that CPU. Looks like I'm gonna have to remove the drive cage. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's get them disconnected. Okay, looks like the drive cage is married to this stiffener bracket here. Looks like we have four screws, two in the front, one up here and one right there. Let's see how far that gets us. Okay, now, does this just come out as one unit? And yes, it does. And now we can get at the CPU. Let's see, we have two slots for L2 cache here. So that's interesting. That means we could bring it up to 512K. Well, let's have a look at that CPU. Well, time to get thermal paste on my fingers. And that's a classic Intel Pentium 1. Let's pull that out of there. Looking good on all the pins, though we do have some schmoo from the thermal grease breaking down over all those years. So let's get that cleaned up. Just ever so gently with a toothbrush and IPA. I may as well get rid of that sticker too. All right, that'll do. I also went ahead and cleaned up the socket. That thermal grease residue probably isn't hurting very much, but I still wanted to get rid of it. Now let's get that CPU back in there. And for these large CPUs, I like to use thermal pads instead of thermal grease. There's really no technical advantage to it. It's just cleaner. Now let's get that freshly cleaned heat sink back on there. All right, let's get the rest of these cables and this power supply out of here. And in order to get to the power supply screws, you have to remove this back plastic cover. And in order to do that, you have to come in behind it and push on this tab here while pushing the entire back plastic panel up towards the power supply. And there we go. And the cleanliness continues inside of the power supply. I've got it opened up so you can have a front row seat to any explosions that are about to happen. Now these power supplies are electronically switched and all you have to do to get them to power on is to short this white wire to ground on this three pin connector. All right, sacrificial hard drives and voltmeters are connected. Let's see what happens. All right, so far so good. We're gonna give that the usual five minutes. All right, five minutes is up. That power supply is as stable as it is clean. Oh, by the way, unless you're very well versed on what not to touch inside a power supply, I highly recommend against taking one apart. There are several points inside a power supply that can give you a pretty good zap even after it's been unplugged. So if you're new to working on power supplies, just try not to touch anything on the circuit board. And that includes these heat sinks because sometimes they can be charged as well. And here's a look at the hard drive. It is indeed a quantum fireball. It's got IBM paraphernalia on it, so it's probably original to the system. Got a capacity of a little over one gigabyte. Manufactured August, 1995. All right, let's give this floppy drive some love. And these have a toolless entry design, so all we have to do is get under these tabs. One on each side. And then it should just lift up. There we go. 
Yeah, it's pretty clean inside here too. Let's just give it the standard service. Clean the heads. Looking good. Now I'll grease the tracking screw. Done and done. Okay, all the rust on this system is kind of annoying. Luckily I have a trick to fix that which works reasonably well. Let's see what old CLR can do for it. I've just got some of that on a paper towel here. All right, not half bad results. Definitely looks a lot better without rust. And through some kind of miracle, that battery still has a decent charge. All right, it's that time again. Testing time. Let's see what this thing does. Well, that's not an encouraging sound. At least the hard drive sounds okay. That clicking seems to be the CD-ROM drive. And we have no post whatsoever. Time to investigate. The post analyzer card says, this thing is super dead, not a single code. That could mean the CPU is dead. It is slightly warm, so it's definitely getting power. Okay, I deoxed and shuffled the RAM around. Let's see what it does now. And we still have no post codes. Oh, but we are posting. Okay, that's weird. I've never seen the post analyzer card lie before. And we got 32 megs of RAM. And we got complaints. Let's get into setup. System information. Let's see what's in there. Okay, well everything looks to be in order. Let's get out of here. Let's see if just exiting setup is enough to make it happy. Save and exit. Aha, we're booting. Windows 95. Yeah, that hard drive sounds great. Hey, it's got the original IBM background. All right, we are in. Check out that ancient version of Netscape Navigator. Let's open that up. Oh no, it's been conquered by IE. No surprise there. Well, apparently they had Earthlink. Earthlink was an internet service provider back then. They probably still are. I haven't checked. Okay, let's get out of here. Let's see what version of Netscape this is. Netscape 4.04. .04. All right, let's get out of here. Let's see what else we have. Not a whole lot, but it does have the original Aptiva image on it with all the IBM software. The IBM Information Superhighway. Doesn't get any more 90s than that. Let's see what's in Aptiva Entertainment. Descent. Let's open that up. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, it's complaining about the missing sound card. I should probably get that back in there. Though the post analyzer card did finally provide us with some info. What is this dancing robot thing? Smart disk agent. I guess it's better than having a stupid disk agent. Let's just close this out. What else do we have? Robo done. Must be a dialer utility. Let's see what documents we have. Nothing. Let's see what's on the root of that hard drive. Games, A. Eh? Oh, that's Descent. PS1 tools. You know, this thing does have some uncanny resemblance to the IBM PS1. It's interesting that it has PS1 software on it. Voyetra. That rings a bell. And that icon looks vaguely familiar. Let's open this up. Of course, it's complaining about the sound card. But I remember this. I don't know why I was using this program back then, but I definitely recognize it. Okay, now I gotta get that sound card back in. One moment. Okay, I got that sound card back in. I went ahead and deoxed the riser and the ISA slot, but it's still not working. Let's see if the system even sees that device. Yeah, it sure does. Okay, there's no telling what could be wrong with that. And I don't have a whole lot of time to go through debugging it. Yeah, we got no sound at all. Well, let's see if the floppy drive works. And it sure does, though it is awfully quiet. You know I don't like that. I like my floppy drives to be good and noisy. Now, I'm not optimistic about the CD-ROM drive. It was clicking and clacking during boot time, so my guess is it's not particularly healthy. Let's see. Yeah, there it goes again. But it does open. I guess this machine was being used in the vertical orientation. That's what these tabs are for. Well, let's see what it does. It just makes a bunch of noise and does nothing. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Let's see if I can get my disk back. Okay, well, at least that works. Okay, well, I couldn't leave it alone. There's no way I'm not going to at least attempt to repair an IBM original CD-ROM drive. So let's see what that thing's clicking about. 
Aha, it's the laser lens. Looks like it can't return to its home position, and I see why. This cover for the laser lens is hitting against the spindle. Let's see if I can just put that back in the position. Well, it's kind of loose in there, but it did go back down. Let's see what it does now. Aha, might be on to something. Now, with the top cover removed, we don't have the upper clamp for this spindle, so testing it while it's open is gonna be tricky. Luckily, I've got tricks. All we have to do is put some bits of magnet above the spindle, and that'll clamp the disc down. So let's see what it does now. Man, look at that, that thing spun up. That might be the only thing that was wrong with this drive. Let's get it back in there and see if it works. All right, the clickety-clackety is gone. Let's see what it does. And yes, it does. All right, that drive's fixed. Hmm, what is this Logit program? I'm not familiar with that one. I'm guessing based on context that it helps you uninstall things. Let's just say no. All right, we're not installing AOL today. Okay, well, let's drop down to DOS mode and check out that hard drive. That thing's making some lovely sounds. Okay, we're somewhat well defragged. Looks like we might be good. Yes, indeed. Okay, let's get this case cleaned up. It's not terribly dirty, it just needs a quick once over. Yep, some light cleaning went a long way. Now I just need to do the same thing for the rest of the case. All right, that's a lot better. This thing's actually in great shape. Gotta love a successful resurrection, especially after the severe letdown of the Mitsubishi system. And this thing being all IBM original just makes it that much better. Still need to find a replacement for that front cover, which I'm sure is probably gonna be next to impossible. Might have to 3D print an approximation of it, but first I have to get a 3D printer. Let's move on to the next system. And the last system is this Gateway 2000 tower. And this thing is one of the most well-built towers I have ever handled. Gateway sure built them well back then. And here we have the gilded Gateway logo as well as a pretty well-preserved Intel Pentium sticker, and a fairly well-preserved Gateway 2000 Happy Family sticker. Model number is P5166, indicating that this is 166 megahertz Pentium 1. Got our CD-ROM and floppy drives here, and I can't tell if these drive blanks are yellowed or if that's just the original color of them. Here's the back side of the machine. It has all the goodies on board, including video, sound, and a game port. It has the Gateway 2000 branded 28.8K modem down here, and that label's kind of hard to read, but we can see it has a build date of October 8th, 1996. Let's just go ahead and set that power supply to the correct voltage. Now, this case has these plastic feet on all four corners, so you could use this thing in either tower or desktop orientation, or even upside down if you're feeling particularly special. In fact, in order to get this thing open, you have to put it in the desktop orientation, and the case is secured by no less than seven screws. So let's get those out of there. Now, with all those screws out of there, it just slides open like a normal desktop. And this system is complete, and just a little bit dusty. I see we have the CPU cache module there, so that's good. That provides us with 256K of L2 cache. These are actually called COAST modules. That's an acronym that stands for cache on a stick. It's a technical term. Onboard video is an ATI 3D Rage 2, and onboard sound is a Creative Viber 16C. I think it's funny how the modem sound output goes to the motherboard. You know you've just got to hear that dial-up negotiation. Let's go ahead and pull that modem out of there. And it's a crusty, dusty 8-bit ISA card made by US Robotics. Definitely original to the system with this gateway manufacturing sticker on it. Now let's check out that RAM. And it's a mystery stick. No indication of size or speed. Probably either PC100 or PC133. And very dusty. And clearly that hard drive is not original. That thing came out of a compact. Let's get all these drives disconnected. I guess Gateway just couldn't find a short enough floppy cable. Let's get power off the motherboard. Now let's check out that cache module. Dusty, dusty. Now let's check out our Intel Pentium. Let's get that heatsink shim off there. Let's clean off the goo. And it certainly is a Pentium 166. Let's pull it out of there. Looking good. Let's put that to the side. 
Now I'm going to have to remove this faceplate in order to get out the drives. It's held on with these metal clips. No plastic breakage here. Gotta love when it's simple. Looks like three screws get that drive cage out. Yeah, there we go. Now for the disk drives, it looks like this entire drive cage also comes out. I see two screws at the top, two on the bottom, and two on each side. Let's see how that goes. I sure do miss when they were this easy to work on. Here's a look at that non-original hard drive, a 20 gigabyte Western Digital Caviar, manufactured December 8th, 2001. The CD-ROM drive is made by Toshiba, manufactured September 1996. And that drive does appear to be original to the system. The floppy drive is made by Panasonic, and it is also original to the system. And hey, it's really clean in there, but that's just not enough for me. It's just a peace of mind thing, and that grease is awfully perished. Not anymore. And the power supply is also original to the system, so let's see if that finally means the end of the sacrificial hard drives. Well, let's find out, shall we? Alright, doing just fine. Alright, yeah, we're good. These things are not relieved of duty just yet. And I am having the best luck with batteries this week. That's making me kind of nervous. Now let's get some thermal paste on that CPU. Now let's get the heatsink back on. Alright, let's see what this thing's got. Power on. And we're already posting. Got 16 megs of RAM. And it is booting. Okay, this looks like a pretty plain DOS install. Yep, as plain as can be. Let's see what version of DOS this is. DOS 622. Well, let's test the floppy drive. And it works. I'm actually gonna go ahead and boot up to that disk because it already has my CD drivers. Control Alt Delete. And there it is, CD drivers loaded. Let's test that thing out. A little bit dusty in there. Noisy little thing. Let's see. And it works. All right, we are fully functional. Well, let's see if it reads CDRs. And yes, it does. You know what that means. Time to see if this thing boots Nopix. And no, it does not. 1996 was a whole other world compared to 2003. I really should put together a distro that can live boot these old machines, but I haven't put a distro together in about 20 years. I'm gonna have to learn that all over again. Well, that's about all the testing I can do with this machine for now, but I'm pretty confident that everything is fine. Let's go ahead and start the case cleanup, because this machine definitely needs it. Let's start by cleaning off these Sharpie letters. IPA usually does the trick for removing Sharpie, or any other permanent marker. A deleted. Now let's delete that E. All right, the E has been erased. Now let's do the faceplate. I'm just gonna use Windex for this. All right, Windex alone isn't cutting it for certain spots like this. So let's carefully try IPA. You have to be real careful with IPA though because it could easily damage labels like this. All right, this thing's looking good. And I went ahead and cleaned up the back too because it was pretty gross. Now it's time to resolve this disaster. Luckily it comes right off. Not much I can do about the damaged paint right now. Now it's time to face it. Just that easy. Well, I sure am glad I picked this thing up. It's the perfect little self-contained DOS and Win9X gaming machine. And so well built. And everything works? Yeah, this one is a gem. They certainly put their best foot forward in the early days of Gateway. Well, I'm still awaiting the arrival of the replacement voltage regulators for the Mitsubishi power supply. I've got pretty much no choice but to fix this thing, because they pretty much don't exist on eBay. If I can get it working long enough to get a pin out, I'll be happy. So stay tuned for that. And as always, my sincerest thanks to everyone who's subscribed and pledged their support on Patreon. And if you're new to the channel, I've got quite a few videos like this now, so be sure to check those out. And I still have more VCF stuff to go through. And that's probably going to be the subject of the next few videos. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching.